Hello, and welcome to the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens, publisher and editor of FilmJerk.com. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you hear and you haven't done so already, please make sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcatching source. While a good review and rating won't increase our chances of being found or being a featured podcast on a podcatcher like Apple or Spotify, it will potentially help increase the odds of someone who does find the show for the first time thinking that clicking play will be a good time investment for them. And it's something that you can even do while you're listening to this episode. On this episode, we'll be taking a tour through the movie rating system, its history, and why it's still vitally important for there to be a voluntary rating system, with a special focus on the only rating that came into existence during the 1980s. This podcast is rated PG-13. And as usual, in order to get to 1984 and the creation of the PG-13 rating, we need to go back in time, all the way back to the very start of the movies. In the early days of movies, there were no ratings. But back then, most movies were less than 10 minutes in length, and they didn't feature sex or nudity or graphic violence, and because movies had no sound, no one would be uttering an expletive or two that might cause some consternation amongst certain viewers. But as movies got longer and more sophisticated, the plots of the movies started to undergo a change. One of those changes was the depiction of sexuality and violence on screen. As the 1920s roared on, movies reflected what was happening in greater society. But so did the battle for public morals. Prohibition wasn't working, and there was a definite move back towards a more puritanical society in certain segments. Sound familiar? Once sound did enter the motion picture world towards the end of the decade, and now activities that could be only hinted at in a silent movie could be more strongly shown, complete with moans and cries of passion, the movement to bring a sense of morality back into the movies grew stronger. That movement was led by Martin Quigley, the publisher of several industry-related books and magazines, including the Motion Picture Almanac, an annual recap of the movie industry, of which I own several copies published between 1947 and 1987, which has been an invaluable source not only for this specific episode, but for many of the previous 75 shows. It would be in the summer of 1929, as Quigley and his family were at the movies in his hometown of Chicago, that he would notice a growing trend that had been happening in motion picture entertainment over the previous two years, a gradual but continual departure from what he considered acceptable moral levels. Quigley felt that the movies had a rising sense of responsibility and a purpose to accept that responsibility for the medium that had been revolutionized with the advent of sound. Quigley would meet with Reverend F.J. Deneen, whom the publisher had gotten to know as a fellow member of the Chicago Motion Picture Commission, which had been set up by Mayor William Hale Thompson to study screen influences and potentially set up local regulative ordinances concerning movie content. Deneen and Quigley shared a desire for an extensive code that not only listed material that was inappropriate for movies, but also contained a moral system that the movies could help to promote, specifically a system based on Catholic theology. Sound familiar? In the fall of 1929, Quigley would meet with Reverend Daniel A. Lord of St. Louis, a trained moralist with an interest in cinema, and the pair would work together on a draft for a potential code to not only control content of what was shown on screens in Chicago, but a code to govern the making of motion pictures altogether. Because why aim for a small space like Chicago when you can force an entire nation to bend to your religious will? Sound familiar? Towards the end of 1929, Quigley and Lord's Code caught the interest of Will H. Hayes, the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, who had been quietly looking for something like this for years. In January 1930, Hayes would present the production code to all the major studios and movie producers during a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings, and at the next formal association meeting in March of 1930, the board of directors of the MPPDA would ratify the code, with a four-year time frame for producers and studios to implement the code before its formal introduction on July 15, 1934. The production code itself is nearly 10 pages long in the 1947 Quigley Motion Picture Almanac and covers not only the general principles of the code, 
but specific applications when it comes to crime against the law, sex, vulgarity, obscenity, profanity, costumes, dancing, religion, locations, national feelings, titles, and quote-unquote repellent subjects, with added regulations for the depiction of crime in motion pictures, costumes, and cruelty to animals. But it's not like the studios were very high on the concept of a production code. They realized that they could avoid more governmental intervention if they adopted the code. Reading the production code more than 90 years after it was created, some of it is just common sense, but most of it is nothing less than imposing one group of people's religious beliefs on everybody else, regardless of other individuals' religious or moral beliefs. Sound familiar? For more than 30 years, the code remained strong. The production code itself didn't assign any kind of rating to a movie. That job was left to the Catholic Liege of Decency, a group founded in 1934 by the Archbishop of Cincinnati, dedicated to identifying objectionable content in motion pictures for members of the church. Members were asked to pledge to patronize only those motion pictures which did not, quote-unquote, offend decency and Christian morality. The Legion of Decency ratings were rather simple at first. An A rating would mean that the film was morally unobjectable to the church. A B rating would signify a movie was morally objectionable, in part. And a C rating would find the movie condemned by the church. Practicing Catholics and their Protestant allies were expected to refrain from viewing such movies. But with the changing times during World War II, the Legion would change their A ratings. A new A1 rating would signify a movie that was acceptable for viewing by a general patronage, while the A2 rating would show a film was only suitable for adults and adolescents to distinguish films suitable for children from those more appropriate for older viewers. Years later, they would also add two more A ratings, an A3 for adults only, and A4 for adults with reservations, all while still retaining the B and C ratings. Condemnation by the Legion of Decency would regularly reduce a film's chances for success, as more than 20 million Catholics and Protestants were going to be avoiding any screening of a condemned film. But most of the films that would receive a C rating were foreign films like Jean Renoir's 1938 film La Bête Humaine and Max Ophel's 1951 film La Ronde, which would not play in smaller towns anyway. But there would be occasional attempts in Hollywood to push the boundaries of the production code and the Legion of Decency ratings. One notable example was the Howard Hughes movie The Outlaw. Completed in February 1941, Hughes had trouble getting his independently produced film approved by the Hollywood Production Code Administration because of the emphasis on, and display of, lead actress Jane Russell's ample and impressive breasts. She is never seen in the nude at any point in the film, but the mere suggestion of cleavage would send the Hayes office into a tizzy, demanding cuts to de-emphasize her curves. They would also demand cuts to other parts of the film, including parts where Billy the Kid, the titular outlaw, was portrayed as a major criminal whose crimes in the movie go unpunished. Hughes would get Russell and Jack Battelle, the actor playing Billy the Kid, back in front of the cameras in March of 1981 to shoot some new scenes to alleviate some of the code office's concerns. One new segment would show Billy was innocent of the crime for which he was being hunted, while another would replace a scene that heavily hinted at Billy and Russell's character Rio having illicit sex with a new scene that shows Rio nursing a sick Billy by warming her with her body. But those scenes would only further aggravate the code office. Joseph Breen, the head of the production code office, would note in a memo about the re-edited film that in more than a decade of critical examination of motion pictures, He had never seen anything quite so unacceptable as the shots of the breasts of the character of Rio, and that throughout almost half of the picture, her breasts, which are quite large and prominent, are shockingly emphasized. Undeterred, Hughes would confer with Breen and the code office who gave the director a list of specific cuts he would need to make concerning Russell's breasts in order to secure a seal of approval. 
Hughes would end up cutting about 30 seconds of footage, and Breen would agree to approve the film with the understanding that all prints put into general release were to conform exactly to the final print Breen had screened and approved. But Hughes was not happy with altering his original vision of his film and started to investigate if it would be possible to circumvent the production code by submitting his original unedited cut to various state censor boards. What his investigations uncovered was that most states would have demanded even more cuts than the code office had asked for. When 20th Century Fox, the studio who had agreed to release the film, heard what Hughes was doing, decided to cancel their contract with the director as it would be Fox, not Hughes, who would be on the hook for a $25,000 fine from the MPPDA for every print of the film released without a code seal of approval. Having spent nearly $1.2 million making the movie, Hughes wasn't going to let this go. The billionaire businessman would have his publicity team call up ministers, women's clubs, and housewives to inform them of the lewd picture that scoundrel Howard Hughes was getting ready to release into theaters. As expected, there would be an immediate rush of decent people calling to have the film banned, which generated the publicity Hughes was looking for to establish a demand for the movie and start getting theaters primed to open it. The outlaw would finally open in theaters on February 3rd, 1943, or more specifically, one theater, the Geary Theater in San Francisco and its release would become the biggest talk of the town in many a year. Hughes's publicist, Russell Birdwell, had spent most of 1942 promoting Russell as Hollywood's newest star, and ordering billboards to be posted around the city with a still of the actress in a provocative pose, with a caption that read, How would you like to tussle with Russell? The Motion Picture Council of San Francisco wrote to the Production Code office to object to the very disgusting portrayal of the feminine star on city billboards. Within days, the police would remove the offending billboards. The movie would run for six weeks at the Geary, and most shows during that run would sell out, with people drawn not only to the movie and the controversy, but to the live 20-minute presentation between Russell and Boutel of a scene that had been cut from the script before filming even began. Hughes was also planning on opening the film in New York City shortly after the San Francisco run. But between the running issues with the code office and the ongoing World War, Hughes would shelve the film until after the war was over. In early 1946, United Artists, which not only distributed movies but owned their own chain of theaters, agreed to release The Outlaw. It was Hughes' expectations that United Artists who was not a signatory of the MPAA at the time, would be able to release his original, unedited version of the film in their own theaters, even if no other theater chain would book it. But Hughes himself was a member of the MPAA, and they warned him that if he was going to release his preferred cut of the film, and not the one he agreed to release with Joseph Breen back in 1941, and didn't tone down the unapproved advertising for the film, it would constitute grounds for suspension or expulsion from the organization. United Artists would open the film at their namesake theater in San Francisco on April 23, 1946, and the very next day, the theater's manager, Al Dunn, was arrested by the San Francisco Police Department for exhibiting a film, quote, offensive to decency, and the print of the film was confiscated. Two days after that, Hughes would resign from the MPAA, and filed a million-dollar lawsuit against the organization. A judge would clear Dunn of all charges and would issue a temporary injunction restraining the MPAA from interfering with the further release of the film, pending a later hearing. Hughes's lawyers were able to argue the production code office was in violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution and of antitrust laws. But in June 1946, another judge would vacate that restraining order saying that the MPAA had not breached their contract with Hughes and that the billionaire could not quote-unquote have his cake and eat it too. Hughes immediately appealed the ruling, and the MPAA agreed that it would take no action against the film pending the appeal. So Hughes and United Artists continued to release the movie across the country, city by city, dealing with the messes as they came up. 
The film would be pulled from Minneapolis theaters in May 1946, while it was completely banned in Maryland in September 1946, with a judge commenting that Russell's breasts hung like a thunderstorm over a summer landscape. That is a direct quote. Censors in Ohio banned the film in December 1946, while the mayor of Indianapolis refused to ban the picture. But it would take a legal battle of nearly a year for the film to finally be released in New York City in September of 1947. And, as you would expect, the controversy was very good for business. Although he had spent another $2 million fighting in various courts to get the film released, the outlaw would have grossed more than $4.5 million by August 1948, when United Artists sold the distribution rights to RKO Radio Pictures, an independent distribution company best known for financing and releasing Orson Welles' first two films, Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons, and had just been purchased two months earlier by Howard Hughes. By April 1952, the film would have grossed another $2.6 million, and by 1968, after several successful re-releases, the total box office for The Outlaw would have been more than $20 million. The film would also cause the first crack between the production code office and the Legion of Decency, who naturally condemned all versions of the film, including the one approved by Joseph Breen. Fans of the 1970s TV show MASH may remember the 1982 episode The Moon is Not Blue, in which Hawkeye and BJ go to great lengths to get a copy of the 1953 Otto Preminger movie The Moon is Blue sent to the camp because they had read in one of Winchester's Boston newspapers that the film had been banned due to salacious content, only to be disappointed when the film finally arrives. The Moon is Blue would be the first major American studio production that would buck the production code. Preminger was amongst the most powerful filmmakers in Hollywood at the time, and United Artists heads Arthur Krim and Robert Benjamin were determined to let the director make his movie about a young woman who meets an architect on the observation deck of the Empire State Building and quickly turns his life upside down the way that he wanted. Not that they had much choice. Their contract with Preminger allowed him complete control over every aspect of the film, including casting David Niven, whose career at the time was not as strong as it had been in previous years, over the objections of the studio heads. As a sign of good faith in exchange for allowing the casting of Niven, Preminger would agree to defer all of his salary as producer and director in exchange for 75% of the profits. Based on a 1951 play by F. Hugh Herbert, which Preminger had directed on Broadway in March of that year, the book of the play was submitted to the production code in July 1951, while Herbert continued working on the actual screenplay. Joseph Breen would personally call Herbert and advise him that the story was in violation of the production code because of its light and gay treatment of the subject of illicit sex and seduction. Again, that is a direct quote. Preminger would submit the completed screenplay to the code office the day after Christmas in 1951, and he would get word back the day after New Year's that the screenplay would not be given a seal of approval, due to numerous lines of dialogue exhibiting, quote, an unacceptably light attitudes towards the seduction, illicit sex, chastity, and virginity, unquote. Four days after that, Preminger and Herbert would inform the code office that they had disagreed with that decision and that they would be making the film anyway, whether they liked it or not. And after two weeks of rehearsal, Preminger would start shooting the movie, which, thanks to the deferral of his salary, was now budgeted at only $400,000, on January 21, 1952. Preminger would spend 24 days shooting the film, and he would have the film edited and ready for its first preview in Pasadena on April 8, 1952, only two months after production was completed. On April 10, having seen the film at the preview, Joseph Breen told Otto Preminger the film as screened would not be approved for a seal of approval. Preminger told Breen what he could do with his disapproval, and United Artists would amend their contract to remove the clause that Preminger needed to deliver a movie that would be given a seal of approval. But, strangely, 
Preminger and United Artists sat on the film for an entire year after that. It would finally open on June 22, 1953 at the Woods Theater in Chicago, with its own adults-only warning on advertising materials, and at the United Nations Theater in San Francisco on June 25th. After securing a number of playdates from three of the largest exhibition companies in America, The Moon is Blue would open in general release on July 8th, and by the end of the year it would have grossed $3.5 million, putting it 15th on the list of highest-grossing movies for 1953. Preminger would battle the code again two years later when he made The Man with the Golden Arm, starring Frank Sinatra as a drug addict who gets clean while in prison but struggles to stay that way once he's released. Like with The Moon is Blue, Preminger sent the screenplay to The Man with the Golden Arm to the code office in advance of production, and Breen once again would deem the story to be unacceptable, this time because of a prohibition on showing illegal drug trafficking and drug addiction. Preminger argued that his film would not entice any viewers to take drugs since the drug use was depicted as having severely negative consequences on its lead character. United Artists had, between the release of The Moon is Blue and the decision to make The Man with the Golden Arm, rejoined the MPAA, and Arthur Krim would personally call Breen in the hopes that they would make an exception to its usual rules and grant the script approval because of the film's immense potential for public service. Breen was unmoved, and Preminger made the movie anyway. And once again, the final film would be denied a seal of approval, and United Artists would quit the MPAA once again because of that decision. And like with The Outlaw years earlier, the movie would cause another crack between the Code Office and the Legion of Decency, although this time the Legion did not condemn the film as Breen expected they would. The film would get a B rating, morally objectionable in part for all, because even the church could see the anti-drug message of the story. And even without the production code seal of approval, and with the Legion only giving it a B rating, a number of large theater circuits would book the film when it was released on Christmas Day in 1955. In December 1956, after the movie had grossed more than $4 million in theaters, the MPAA announced that it was going to change several provisions of the production code, and that the film industry had revised and relaxed its codes of morals and taboos for the first time since the code was adopted in 1930. In addition to revising restrictions about the portrayals of prostitution, abortion, kidnapping, and miscegenation, the MPAA eliminated the absolute prohibition of subjects having to do with narcotics. And in June 1961, both The Moon is Blue and The Man with the Golden Arm would be given production code seals of approval, which would allow both films to be released into theaters again, as well as be sold to television broadcast networks. But Joseph Breen would not be around to see the production code changes. In 1954, after the battles over The Outlaw, The Moon is Blue, and a few other independent American films that challenged the code, Breen would retire. He claimed during an exit interview with Aileen Mosby that even after all the recent battles over the code, that it was stronger than ever and still had tremendous support all across the country. But the writing was on the wall. Movies like Rebel Without a Cause and Blackboard Jungle were challenging the status quo in Hollywood even while conforming to the code's ethos. The Hollywood studios, always trying to appear better than they really were, would vote to give Breen an honorary Oscar for his conscientious, open-minded, and dignified management of the motion picture production code. As the 50s segged into the 60s, more filmmakers and studios were willing to challenge the production code because society was changing, audiences were becoming more sophisticated, and were hungry for stories that reflected what was really happening in the world. Comedies like Billy Wilder's 1959 film Some Like It Hot and Once again, Otto Preminger's 1959 Anatomy of a Murder were direct assaults on the production code, and both would become smash hits without a seal of approval. Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 classic Psycho was barely approved for a seal, but not without a number of cuts to appease the censors. In 1964, Sidney Lumet's Holocaust-themed drama The Pawnbroker, starring Rod Steiger, would be rejected because of two scenes between actresses 
Linda Geyser and Thelma Oliver, in which they would fully expose their breasts, and a scene between Oliver and an actor that the code office felt was unacceptably sex-suggestive and lustful. The producers and the film's distributor, Allied Artists, appealed the decision to the MPAA, which would, by a vote of 6-3, to three, give the film an exemption because of its overall subject matter. Provided the producers attempt a reduction in the length of the scenes, which the Code Administration had found unacceptable. And The Pawnbroker would become the first movie to feature any kind of nudity to receive a seal of approval. Some at the time saw this as a sea change in the industry, while others, like a writer for the New York Times, emphatically exclaimed that this unprecedented movie would not set a precedent. But it would. Over the course of the next two years, more and more filmmakers dared to push the envelope farther than anyone had tried before. In 1965, Warner Brothers Pictures had contracted Mike Nichols, a former comedic actor turned Broadway director, to make his feature film debut with Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, the 1963 Tony Award winner for Best Play, which had featured some frank language unheard on movie screens ever. In May 1966, when the film was completed and going through the code office, the production code was now headed by a 45-year-old Jack Valenti, a former special assistant to President Lyndon B. Johnson, who did not share his predecessor's views about the ills of society and the movie's effects on said society. Valenti saw the code as being out of date and personally worked with director Mike Nichols to find a middle ground on the language in the movie. Nichols would slightly alter certain profanities, such as Martha's screw you scream to God damn you, while other sayings such as up yours, monkey nipples, and hump the hostess would be allowed to stay in the film as is. Warner Brothers would also agree to have a new revision added to all of their advertising materials, suggested for mature audiences, and theaters were required to not allow anyone under the age of 18 to see the movie without adult supervision. The League of Decency, which had recently regraded itself as the National Catholic Office for Motion Pictures, would give the film an A4 rating, morally unobjectable for adults, with reservations. After more challenges to the production code from movies like Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up, and fearing a governmental crackdown on Hollywood, Valenti got to work to come up with an entirely new system, a voluntary rating system that could be applied to movies without spiritual concepts that alienated many who did not practice that one specific religion. And the new rating system would go into effect on November 1st, 1968, and it would have four ratings. G, suggested for general audiences, M, suggested for mature audiences, parental discretion advised, R, restricted, persons under 16 not admitted without a parent or adult guardian, and X, persons under 16 not admitted. The X rating was a compromise. Valenti didn't want it. He thought parents should be smart enough to know what type of content they should or should not be able to take their kids to. But again, fear of governmental intrusion would lead to its creation. However, unlike the G, M, and R ratings, the X rating would not be trademarked, so that filmmakers who knew they had material in their film that kids shouldn't be seeing could self-apply the rating without submitting it to the new ratings board. We know how that turned out. In 1970, the ages for R and X ratings would be raised from 16 to 17, And the M rating was changed to GP, all ages admitted, parental guidance suggested, as some parents were confused if M-rated movies were suitable for children. Two years later, due to more confusion about what the GP rating stood for, the MPAA would reverse the lettering. GP became PG. Parental guidance suggested some materials may not be suitable for pre-teenagers. And for more than a decade, the rating system remained unchanged and trust in the rating system amongst parents would regularly enjoy a higher than 85% approval rating in polls. That was until the summer of 1984. In May, 
Paramount Pictures released Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the second film in what had just become the Indiana Jones series after the global success of Raiders of the Lost Ark. But in 1983, while the film was being prepared and written, Steven Spielberg was going through some dark times. He was a producer on the Twilight Zone movie, on which one of the segments, Vic Morrow and two young Asian children, had died during a stunt gone wrong. And he was not only feeling heavy guilt over what had happened on the set of one of his films, he was being sought out by investigators who wanted to know how the accident could happen. Temple of Doom is a far crueler and more disturbing film than Raiders of the Lost Ark, including one scene which involves a high priest ripping a still-beating heart out of a man's chest. But the MPAA, with some suggested additions to minimize the on-screen gore and violence, gave the film a PG rating. And again, PG meant parental guidance suggested. Some material may not be suitable for children. But by 1984, many parents saw movies rated G and PG to be child-friendly, period. So many were shocked to see what was happening on screen. Two weeks after the release of Temple of Doom, Warner Brothers would release the brilliant Joe Dante black comedy Gremlins, which had been executive produced by Steven Spielberg. In Gremlins, a high school kid accidentally releases a series of destructive creatures on his small town after his father brings home a cute but strange pet that comes with a specific set of rules for its care. The actions of the malevolent gremlins were shocking to some viewers who were lured in by an advertising campaign that focused on the cute, soft, and cuddly mogwai gizmo, while only hinting at the horrible things the gremlins could be capable of. Remember, this was a time when certain religious groups were trying to get music they considered offensive to come with warning stickers, and were lobbying to have television shows rated in a similar fashion to movie ratings. Spielberg, who had also produced Poltergeist in 1982, which also received some criticism for being a PG movie that featured a guy peeling the flesh and muscle off of his face during a brief hallucinatory scene, would suggest an intermediate rating, PG-13, that would specifically acknowledge that some material in those rated films were not appropriate at all for children under 13. Like the G and PG ratings, it would be a cautionary rating, which meant theaters would not be required to check any kind of identification for anyone who appeared under the age of 13 if they wanted to buy a ticket to a PG-13 movie. And let's face it, how many 13-year-olds were walking around carrying a government-issued ID in their wallet or pocket in 1984? Valenti would go to his partners in the rating system and make the proposal. And on Wednesday, June 27, 1984, the Motion Picture Association of America agreed to create the PG-13 rating, with the rating going into effect on Sunday, July 1st. That's how quickly this all came together. So how would the PG-13 rating actually work? Whenever a film would be rated PG-13, all advertising materials, being newspaper, magazine, and television ads, and movie trailers and posters, would need to have a new explanatory statement which would read, quote, Parents are strongly cautioned to give special guidance for attendance of children under 13. Some material may be inappropriate for young children, unquote. And any movie that had been previously rated would not be re-rated regardless of whether it had been released or not until there had been changes to the movie since it had been previously rated. That would not satisfy some of the rating system's critics, especially the ones who still wanted movies like Temple of Doom and Gremlins to be re-rated, even though they were still playing in theaters and still bringing in sizable business. And it didn't particularly make Jack Valenti happy either. He still felt the PG rating was already sufficient enough warning there might be some material in a film that might not be appropriate for children. But he had to acknowledge that many theater operators had been asking for something between a PG and an R for years, that all the studio heads were for it, and that a large portion of the movie-going public felt it would be an improvement. But, in fact, up until a week before the rating was announced, many of those who would be deciding the fate of the new rating still weren't convinced it was needed. The head of the National Association of Theater Owners, Joel Resnick, told reporters when asked about the possibility of a new rating in late June, said that no resolution or understanding had been reached between the theater owners and the MPAA, and that he anticipated both he and Valenti would have homework to do once they started talking again. 
Bud Levy, an executive with the Translux Theater chain and the head of the theater owner's classification and ratings committee, thought it might be better to simply include the reasons why any movie not rated G was given its rating. And this practice would begin in September 1990 for R-rated movies. At the same time, the NPAA changed the X rating to NC-17, and in 2000, rating explanations would be added for PG, PG-13, and NC-17 movies. In fact, not 10 days before the rating was announced, Levy voiced doubt that any change to the rating system would happen before the next scheduled meeting of his committee, which was scheduled in October. And he really didn't expect anything to happen until 1985, at the earliest. So what happened? Paramount Pictures, whose release of Temple of Doom helped to spark the new calls for a new rating, were tired of all the bad publicity that was coming to them with the protests. And they would get together with the other major studios and advocated for the new rating. The new rating would help allow filmmakers to be more creative by giving them a middle ground where envelopes could be pushed without risking an R rating. And once it was clear to Valenti and the MPAA that the studios were united on this new rating, it all came together in a matter of days. And as it would happen, the first movie to be rated PG-13 would be viewed on July 1st, the first day the rating came into effect. Gary Marshall had been a successful writer and producer on television for more than two decades, having created such shows as Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, and Mork and Mindy, for the ABC Television Network. He had branched out into movies in 1982 with Young Doctors in Love, a parody of soap operas, which featured a number of ABC soap opera stars, made possible by the film's production company, ABC Motion Pictures. It was successful enough at the box office, grossing $30 million on a $7 million budget, and Marshall would be given the cachet to make something a little more stronger for his second effort. Sweet Georgia Brown had been written in the early 1970s by Neil Marshall, no relation to Gary Marshall, about his time as a cabana boy near his Long Island home and the moments when the values of his more modest upbringing clashed with those of the upper-class guests at the beach club. The script had been floating around Hollywood for so long it had been recommended to producer Michael Phillips, who won an Academy Award for producing The Sting in 1973, by Cass Elliott, one of the four members of the Mamas and Papas who had died of a heart attack in London in 1974. But Phillips couldn't find financing for the film at the time, and he would let his option on the script lapse in 1976. But six years later, Phillips would reacquire the option to make the script into a movie, and he would get Gary Marshall interested in it shortly after the release of Young Doctors in Love while the two were playing basketball at Phillips' house. Marshall would take the script to Brandon Stoddard, the head of ABC Motion Pictures, to get the production company on board. It would take a few months, but after agreeing to some changes and a $9 million budget, ABC was on board. Gary Marshall would bring Neil Marshall in to rewrite the screenplay before bringing Bo Goldman the Oscar-winning screenwriter of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Melvin and Howard in for additional rewrites. And although Gary Marshall, Neil Marshall, and Bo Goldman were all Jewish, and the story was about a middle-class Jewish kid dealing with the mostly non-genteel clientele, the lead character of Jeffrey was changed from Jewish to Goy when it was decided to move the story from taking place in the mid-1950s to the summer of 1963 the last summer of America's innocence before the assassination of President John F. Kennedy and the ramp-up of the Vietnam conflict. The movie's title would change from Sweet Georgia Brown to Mr. Hotshot as the film was going into production in late August 1983 and then change again to The Flamingo Kid after production finished. On July 2nd, the day after the PG-13 rating became official, The Flamingo Kid would be the first movie to be given the new rating. I spend a bit of time talking about The Flamingo Kid because of the irony that the first movie to be given this new rating that had been spurred on by higher-than-expected levels of violence in two specific movies released four and six weeks earlier went to a film that had no violence at all. The Flamingo Kid would be rated PG-13 for language and a very brief snippet of nudity. Producer Michael Phillips, when asked about having his film become the first movie with the new rating, 
would say that it was great, and he felt it was appropriate. It's a little spicier than a plain PG, he would say. We have a bit of nudity, and we do have occasion where someone says more than darn it when a character is angry. The subject matter is more appropriate for people 13 and over. It's just more sophisticated than child fare. The first PG-13 movie to actually be released in the theaters would cause another firestorm of controversy over its violent content. John Millius' Red Dawn depicted a narrative where the United States, after the collapse of NATO and other global issues, left the country isolated from the rest of the world, had been invaded by the Soviet Union with the help of Cuban and Nicaraguan forces. A group of high school kids in Calumet, Colorado, flee into the woods after their small town has been captured by the invading forces, and after some training by a fighter pilot who had been shot down by a Cuban MiG-21, become a group of wannabe Rambos who try to take their town back. Red Dawn was the perfect movie for a Reagan-era America, and the $17 million movie would become a minor hit, grossing $34 million, much of that coming from the interest in the new rating and from the controversy surrounding the violence. Shortly after the film was released on August 10, 1984, the Guinness Book of World Records would honor the film as being the most violent movie ever made, counting 254 acts of violence over the film's 114-minute running time an average of 2.23 acts of violence every single minute. The film would get savaged by most critics, but the gun owners of America would honor the director for dramatically depicting the importance in our time of the Second Amendment. And in 2009, the National Review would place Red Dawn 15th on its list of the best conservative movies ever made. The PG-13 rating would become a catch-all for the films that were too adult for kids, but not quite adult enough for adults. Amongst the movies to be rated PG-13 during the second half of 1984 included the Steve Martin Lily Tomlin comedy All of Me, the John Cassavetes drama Love Streams, the Gene Wilder comedy The Woman in Red, which would be released into theaters just five days after Red Dawn, and a teen comedy called The Zoo Gang, that its producer, Michael Hirsch, and distributor New World Pictures would spend the remainder of 1984 protesting the rating, saying it wasn't fair that a movie that was written and produced before the new rating took effect was being given the new rating. The film would finally be released in May of 1985 with its PG-13 rating intact. And since 1984, there have only been a couple of changes to the rating system, both of them involving the X rating. In 1990, there had been calls for a replacement to the X rating because of its regular voluntary use by pornographic films, with something that could indicate to parents a film's content was absolutely inappropriate for children, even if they were going to be accompanied by a parent or guardian. Roger Ebert would suggest an A rating for adults, but in the end, Valenti and the MPAA went with NC-17, which simply meant no child under the age of 17 would be admitted. Without the pornographic stigma, hopefully, that was attached to the X rating. And movies like The Godfather of Part 3 and Goodfellas would initially be given NC-17 ratings due to their violence and excessive language, but both would be edited down to secure an R rating. The first movie to be officially given and released with the NC-17 rating would be Philip Kaufman's Henry and June, a biographic film based on a posthumously released book by French-American novelist Anais Nin about her torrid polyamorous affair with novelist Henry Miller and his wife June Miller. But it would not be a success, grossing less than $12 million in the United States. And the final change to the rating system came in 1996 when the NC-17 rating would be slightly altered. Now, instead of no children under 17 admitted, The rating was no one 17 and under admitted. Now, I'm not here to convince you that the American movie rating system is perfect because it's not. Not every parent parents the same way, and not every child of a certain age is as mature or immature as anyone a few years younger or older than them. But I will forever be an advocate for a centralized voluntary rating system like it because of the alternative that actually did exist for a number of years. So, let's take a movie like Kevin Smith's 1999 movie Dogma, in which an abortion clinic worker with a special heritage is called upon 
to save the existence of humanity from being negated by two renegade angels trying to exploit a loophole and re-enter heaven. The film was rated R for strong language, including sex-related dialogue, violence, crude humor, and some drug content. And the head of the Catholic League, William Donahue, would spend months before its release lambasting the film, even though he only had access to an early version of Smith's script, claiming that actors and film critics who liked the movie were not disturbed by the anti-Catholicism that they themselves were acknowledging without himself acknowledging that Smith was a still practicing Catholic. The film would become a hit, in part because if there was one thing that Miramax president Harvey Weinstein could do right, between sexually harassing his female employees and the actresses in Miramax movies and practically any female who walked into his offices, was to milk controversy into box office gold. But imagine if Kevin Smith and Miramax had to get the film rated instead of by one centralized group like the MPAA, and instead had to get it rated by every state or city in the country and be forced to edit the film based on local concerns or morals. And this isn't hyperbole, because as we already mentioned earlier in this episode when talking about the Howard Hughes movie The Outlaw, there were a number of state and local boards in existence that could effectively force filmmakers to change their movies for what they expected for their local citizens or force filmmakers to not play their films within the boundaries of their jurisdiction at all. Most of these groups would disappear after the creation of the modern MPAA rating system, mostly because of the cost of maintaining a local film's rating board when that money could be used more effectively elsewhere. But one city would keep its 26-person local film classification going until 1993. The Dallas Motion Picture Classification Board had actually started back in 1911 when the Dallas City Council appointed individuals to review films and was one of a number of local ratings boards to continue to exist even after the introduction of the Hollywood rating system, thanks in part to a 1968 Supreme Court ruling on the Community Standards Doctrine, which upheld the constitutional authority of cities and states to limit youth exposure to books and films that cannot be denied to adults. What irked Hollywood about the Dallas board was how they could effectively hold a film hostage by imposing its own not-suitable ratings to films that were not restricted by the MPAA ratings board. The Dallas board had three classifications, suitable for young persons, not suitable for young persons, or suitable except with the accompanying symbols of L, S, V, D, N, and or P for language, sex, violence, drugs, nudity, or perversion, respectively. A film deemed not suitable would forbid anyone under the age of 16 in Dallas from seeing the movie at a theater, even if they were with their parents. The Dallas Board's classifications had to be displayed in all Dallas newspaper advertisements in place of the MPAA rating and at all theaters. And local violations of the ordinance, such as a theater selling tickets to unaccompanied youths in order to watch a movie deemed not suitable, would carry a fine of up to $200 per day. Movies like 1978's Invasion of the Body Snatchers and 1980's Airplane, which were rated PG by the MPAA, would be deemed not suitable by the Dallas Board. In Invasion of the Body Snatchers, there are two scenes that feature lead actress Brooke Adams without clothes. One scene has her hidden behind some foliage, while the other is a long shot of her walking through a factory. While it is clear she is fully nude in both scenes, her pubic hair or buttocks cannot be seen, and the combined time she is naked totals less than 30 seconds, or about one half of 1% of the running time of the movie. In Airplane, there are two very short scenes where a woman's bare breasts can be viewed, as well as a memorable scene where it appears that stewardess Elaine is giving the autopilot a hummer. Those two nude scenes total about 10 seconds of the running time and the BJ gag less than a minute, but it was clearly too much for the Dallas Film Board. I was 11 when Body Snatchers was released and 12 when Airplane arrived in theaters. Neither film was the first time I had seen a woman's breasts nor was Airplane the first time I was exposed to the concept of fellatio. And I can attest that I didn't become a murderous sex fiend due to those exposures. 
One of the Dallas Film Board members in an interview with the New York Times in December 1979 defended the board by saying they were not qualified to rate movies, but they were qualified to tell their Dallas neighbors what they would like their children to see. Even as she points out that she felt the city should not be able to restrict youthful moviegoers. Another member of the board in the same article would describe the board as a cross-section of the community that was trying its best to apply the ordinance to what members felt were community standards. Of the 26 board members at the time, only five of them were men, and only one member was non-Caucasian. The article would finish with a quote from Philip Wunsch, a film critic for the Dallas Morning News and a lifelong Dallas resident, noting that the board created image problems for the city and other parts of the country. The film board is not representative of Dallas, he would say. It gives the idea that Dallas is the way it was back in the 50s, a staunch conservative community, and it's changed since then. Yet, for many years, Dallas was not the last local ratings board. In 1976, the Memphis Film Board was shut down after its operations were considered unconstitutional, and the ratings board for the entire state of Maryland ceased operation in 1981. But the Dallas board kept going despite a number of lawsuits by the major studios over the years until the city decided to abolish the board on August 11, 1993. Fred Arbach, the Dallas dentist who had served as the board's chairman for its final six years, was staunchly adamant that he and his fellow board members were doing the right thing, telling the Washington Post the day after the decision was made that Dallas was, quote, the last bastion of decency and traditional family values, unquote. He felt that the city had signaled to the world that Dallas no longer cared and had become a partner with Hollywood in the war on America. Sound familiar? Auerbach was critical of the movie The Crying Game during his interview. Rather than try to sanitize what he said, I'm just going to present his quote in full. You need to know it's there, he said, referring to things like indecent behavior and deviant sex. Because if you see this over and over, you become desensitized to accepting it as the norm of behavior. The crying game is a perfect example. That is the biggest conspiracy of the media and the motion picture industry I have ever seen in my life. And that's why the MPAA cannot be trusted. Why not just say there's homosexual activity? Just say it. And I bet 10 to 1 it would not have had the box office attraction it had in the first three weeks, because people don't necessarily want to see it. Again, that is a direct quote. And his final quote about the board summated his feelings that could have been easily said in 2022, as he did in 1993. This is not a dead issue, he would say. People don't trust Hollywood. That's the bottom line. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again in two weeks when episode 77 is released. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website at filmjerk.com for extra materials about the movies we covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>